from the Journal of Midnight Shower. Day 4. Bearing in mind the extreme security on this terminal, and the sensitive nature of the charts and documents already stored within, I have decided that it should be safe to record the particulars of my assignment and the discussion which led to my being thrust into the cultural wasteland. And by that, of course, I mean any place that is not Canterlot. I wish to do so now, while the words of the princess are still fresh in my head, before time and events further mar the memory. I suppose I could have a memory orb treatment, but such objects are terrifyingly lacking in proper security. Any unicorn could get into them. I should first note that I took this assignment willingly, even eagerly. There are some things that are simply more important to a pony than proper surroundings, proper meals, and proper company. And for every pony, the foremost of those things is their special talent, as magically emblazoned on their flank by their cutie mark. Sadly, there are ponies whose only talent in life is to be stuck up, bored, or a rock farmer, or something equally as awful. But I had a unique misfortune of having a cutie mark of an event that would never occur within my lifetime. The last con teen Contennial meteor shower occurred in Ponyville ten years ago, before I was born. Ten years before I was born. And the next is not scheduled to occur until decades after I am likely to have passed away. So the ability to not only see, but actually touch anything very that my cutie mark represents, to hold it in my hooves, was too overwhelming a gift to possibly turn away. Being the royal astronomer comes with many benefits, not the least of which is be, uh, <coughs> being within the same orbit as the princesses. I have been in the same position to observe them in less than entirely formal company, and have even had the occasion to speak to Princess Luna or Princess Celestia in years prior to their beckoning. As such, I believe I have constructed a better assessment of the character of each of the princesses than most any pony in their, perhaps, other than perhaps the royal guard, each other, and some of the castle staff. For example, Princess Luna is the younger sister. She is also the smaller and the cuter sister. As a result of these traits, I have seen many ponies fall prey to the notion that she might also be the weaker and the far more innocent of the two. It is a misconception I have seen the princess herself play on more than one occasion. Occasionally, with devastating precision. If anything can be said of the night princess, it is that she is the darker of the two. In my personal estimation, ponies are often inclined to suspect Princess Celestia is capable of acts that our benevolent princess would never commit, and equally inclined to underestimate what Princess Luna is capable of. It was with these things in my mind that many in the castle were fearful of what has come after the zebra attempts to assassinate Princess Celestia. For days, Princess Luna locked herself away in her chambers, refusing meetings with every pony, save her sister. On the fourth day, she called her cabinet to her and the six mares, met with the princesses for most of the day, and the fifth. After that, I was summoned. To my surprise, Princess Luna was neither wrathful, nor cold, nor overcome with remorse. She was if I had to put a word to it, contemplative. She invited me in, offered refresh refreshment, and made sure I was comfortable, which I was, aside from being dreadfully nervous. And then she opened up to me, telling me things I do not believe she has likely shared with any pony outside of her inner circle, if only because it is a subject matter she chooses not to discuss. I shall endeavor to describe the words of Her Majesty Princess Luna, as best I can recall. If you were to listen to the old pony tales, they would have you believe that the conflict between Celestia and myself 
happened over the course of an evening, which, after the fashion, I suppose it did. But it was not a typical evening, the way it was told. One would think I threw a tantrum, or that my sister hurled me into a lunar prison at the climax of a breakfast squabble. Celestia did not choose to harness the most powerful magic energies of all Equestria and turn them against me, either lightly or swiftly. In my insanity, I gave her no other choice, and she still tried every avenue to reason with me. Nor was the attack unexpected or unprepared for. What the history books gloss over and the myths leave out entirely is that the morning I rebelled lasted longer than what would normally be considered a week. There were also those who mistakenly believed that because Princess Celestia raised and lowered my moon for thousands of years, that she is more powerful, and that her banishment of me was petty and unnecessary, as she could have just taken control and lowered my moon herself. That is not the case. She could only raise my moon all of these centuries because I was not there, as I would have been able to raise her son in her absence. When it comes to the night, to use an ancient term, my power triumphs hers. I held my moon high and forced her son to stay down for over a week's time, and she could do nothing about it. I cannot properly convey the sense of sorrow, bitterness, and remorse that hid behind Princess Luna's words. Yet regardless of how much private pain this revisiting inflicted, the Night Princess persevered. By the end of it, Equestria had entered a deep winter. The freezing cold was killing plants and wildlife alike. The ponies everywhere were suffering and facing death from cold and starvation. I did not care. I was in a great rage and wanted to punish. My wrath did not just spill into our lands. Before the end, both the griffins and the zebras had sent agents to assassinate me. But my power and the protection of my armor, they stood no chance, and I laid them low. Celestia did what she had to, and even she could not break me of my madness. Even my sister was not powerful enough, or pure enough of heart, to save me. It took others to do that. There was a spark that is required to power the elements of harmony to their fullest. And that is hard to generate if the spark, if one is acting alone. Words cannot express the depth of emotion I felt from those revelations. The wonder and the horror of them was beyond my expression. Princess Luna gave me time to digest these things, and finally, to dare ask why she had chosen to confine them in such a lowly pony as myself. To be honest, there was part of me that feared for my life. Such secrets were not for the likes of mere astronomers, royal or otherwise. I wish you would understand the context that I suspect surrounds the task I must ask you to undertake, she told me. You must understand two things. First, that the conflict between Celestia and myself did not happen dare I say, overnight. I had planned, made preparations. I had anticipated that Celestia would use the elements against me eventually, and that others would try to stop me even sooner. So I had mystical armor fashioned for myself out of the rarest and most magical stewards of all metals. What I did not foresee is that my sister would banish me. I had expected her to attempt to strike me down, and my defenses were designed around such an assumption. I had expected my sister to be as cruel as I had become, and thus I lost. With what she produced, a small, plain lockbox, she used her levitation, floating the box to a distance, as if loathing to touch it. Setting the lockbox before me, she opened it with yet another spell, revealing a charred and twisted scrap of metal. This is a piece of Nightmare Moon's armor. She bade me to take it, examine it. The metal was light and cool to the touch, pale blue with an extraordinary sheen that put Silver to shame. I asked her where in Equestria she had found such magic. The metal is not native to Equestria. In fact, it is not native to this world at all. Every 100 years, our skies of our world are graced with a meteor shower. There was one 
in the year of Neramoon, and had set free, and I was saved. On the longest day of the 1000th anniversary of my incarceration, I can see you have done the math, and it is worth noting that on rare occasions, perhaps once every dozen showers, not all of the meteors burn up in the sky. There have been impacts. During the meteor shower on which occurred in the year I was banished, there was one such impact in the Everfree Forest, not far from the old castle. I believe the zebra's name for this is Star Metal, and they have considerably more myths about it than we do. I want you to go to Zebra Town. You may take this with you, and learn all you can about these myths. The zebra's reaction to my position has been more extreme than we had anticipated. For the sake of all of Equestria, I need to understand why. Reading that passage while I recovered may have been a mistake. I had never envisioned what Nightmare Moon had done before. Never even tried. Now that I did, the vision shook my soul with horror. I was in a great rage, and I wanted to punish. I felt myself grow pale. I thought of myself tearing through one of the shops in Arbru, telekinetically throwing the ponies inside up to the ceiling so I could see their Arbru mark, then opening fire with the zebra rifle and releasing their burning, filling body, bodies to flood to the ground. There it was. I was Nightmare Moon in miniature. But if Nightmare Moon could become Princess Luna again, then she could lift herself from such an abyss of monstrosity to become the loving and love-worthy goddess of our French worship, then there really was hope for me. The words in the journal gave me the confidence that my hopes were more than just wishful thinking. At the same time, they were a reminder of the stain of my fury-driven murders that would never fade away. Stilhus was right. Like Princess Luna, I would remember forever what I had done. And like the zebras remembered the actions of Nemer Moon, there would be those to whom I could never be anything but that monster. Zenith had given me the last of the healing potions. The third medical box had been locked as well, but it turns out lockpicking isn't required when one of your friends has a hellhound horn capable of slashing through metal with the ease of slicing up an apple. I drank it, watching the medical assist warnings on my EFS slowly die away. The next zombie zebra gets a missile up its kisser, Sheila's grumbled. I had gleaned that the battle in the pool had been frustrating. His armor refused to allow him to fire his weapons underwater. The mental picture of two creatures who could not die from anything less than a massive bodily harm being induced to them, throwing hooves at each other underwater, struck me as darkly amusing. I don't think steel hooves would appreciate it if I snickered, though. Soon, we are moving again. The bathhouse was not the prison we were looking for. The plantheor of Canterlot's zebras, and the absence of alicorns, told me that. But the basement of the bathhouse gave us an entrance to the sewers, and as much as I hated the idea of exposing ourselves to the water there, I couldn't ignore one of the most likely places for the alicorns to be holding their captives. Fortunately, since both Zenith and I had both landed in the bath bathhouse water, with no discernible ill effects, I suspected the concentration of pink in the rainwater was low enough to be reasonably safe. Or, at least, that's what I kept telling myself, as soon as we were almost belly deep in flowing rainwater, pushing our way through the huge, dark tunnels beneath Zebra Town. From the Journal of Midnight Shower, Day 7. Today, I availed myself to one of the more unique buildings in Zebra Town. The zebras had made an interesting effort to blend their cultural heritage with a more proper equestrian aesthetic. One of the results is the infamous bathhouses of Zebra Town. Water is piped in from the aqueduct, and several of the pools are boiler heated. Patrons move between hot baths and cool as they mingle and discuss the matters of the day, or enjoy a poolside brunch with the 
provided tables. As utterly unclothed as bathing publicly is, I admit that the experience provided in these bath houses is luxurious, both physically and socially. I was astonished to discover that there were ponies living in Zebra Town, only a hoofful, I am told, but there were ponies who have chosen to live their lives out in this place, on purpose. I had the opportunity to converse with such a pony in the bathhouse, a decent, delightful, pleasant mare, named Daisy. It is Daisy's assertion that she chose to live here because the zebras needed to be reminded that not all ponies are, in her words, xenomorphic bigots. And on the matter of irrational fears, I found myself the subject of just such sentiments when a zebra mother screamed and pulled her foal from the bath, as soon as the bathhouse entirely, upon the mere sight of me. When I endeavored to determine what I had done to provoke this rather extreme response, most of the zebras would not meet my eyes out of embarrassment. One finally explained, her face reddened with shame, that the mark of the three streaked meteors on my flank was the source of the zebra's terror. It would appear that the myths of the zebras had such a hold on the psyche of some that my cutie mark alone is cause for such reaction. Upon leaving the bathhouse, I noticed several zebra colts quickly attempting to hide an inhaler, looking for all the land like they had been caught by their parents reading an issue of Wingboner magazine. I am hardly a pony to know about such things, but I suspect they were using illegal zebra imported pharmaceuticals. Perhaps the constables needed to be keeping a better watch. Whoosh! Twin missiles shot out from Steel Hooves armor integrated battle saddle and barreled down the sewer tunnel. More than enough firepower to kill even a canterlot zombie zebra. The rockets exploded against the Alicorn shields with almost no effect. Ahead of us, the cave like tunnel continued beyond the grid work of heavy iron bars which blocked our way. Stools and Calamity tried to occupy the purple coated Alicorn as I hacked a wall mounted terminal that control had access to a heavy metal door inset in the side of the sewer tunnel. I worked as quickly as I could, hacking through the system, scanning strings of data for possible passwords. A door clanged and slid open as I found and entered the correct pass bays. Not a rainbow. We charged inside blindly, Steelhooves hiding a proximity mine on the back side of the terminal before closing the door behind us and plunged us into darkness. Several pairs of glowing lights flickered in the darkness. My EFS compass was showing floor four red lights. I slipped into sats and locked onto the first zombie zebra, aiming little Macintosh right for the deadlights of its eyes. Blam! Blam! The powerful little revolver echoed in the metal chamber. Steelhoof's helmet spotlight burst to life, revealing a long amateur labor laboratory filled with tables of ancient chemistry sets. The zombie zebra I had shot lay dead, most of its head removed. I really hoped it couldn't get back up from that. Three more stood about the lab, one of them holding a spear in its mouth. Steelhoof's opened fire, turning one corner of the lab into a blast zone, filling the room with smoke, heat, and shattered glass. I quickly averted my eyes and bucked over a table, crouching behind the back blast of Steelhoof's attack. Calamity and Zenith joined me. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Calamity yelled out, covering his hat with a foreleg. Steelhooves, thank the goddesses, stopped firing explosives. A second later, the spear struck into the table, the metal blade gleaming green as it pierced through the table, slashing at my shoulder. I cried out, pressing a hoof to stop the bleeding. Calamity flew up, firing his Nova Surge rifles, <laughs> while Zenith pulled out healing bandages and treated my wound. Um. I heard another explosion, but this was from outside the door. The Alicorn had tried to use the terminal 
instead of the mind. She wouldn't be getting in. I felt a wave of dizziness. My fear of permanent damage to my head resurfaced. But then the dizziness was joined by a gut-wrenching feeling, and I doubled over. Poison, Zina said simply. Fear not, I know this brew. You will suffer, but only a little. Then you'll be good as new. As I doubled over in agonizing cramps, I found myself strongly disagreeing with Zenith's definition of a little. I heard the horrible necromantic sounds of a zombie zebra I had shot getting back up. Calamity fired again, and I heard it liquefy. The last zombie zebra leapt over the table, turned to face Zenith and me. I tried to focus, aiming with a Macintosh, but a tearing, twisted pain in my abdomen obliterated my concentration, leaving me to gasp for air and pray for unconsciousness. Zenith moved swiftly, striking the zombie zebra with a hoof. I saw her eyes widen in fear as the monster failed to be paralyzed. Taking advantage of her attack and sinking its teeth into her back just between one of her shoulder blades. Don't touch me! Zenith screamed, twisting away, her coat and flesh tearing bloodily as she pulled herself from the teeth of the monster. She whipped her head about, the hellhound horn slicing at the zebra. Her attacker's head tumbled from its body and rolled, stopping in front of my face, its deadlights in its eyes fading out as it stared lifelessly at me. Zenith screamed again, pounding her hooves against the corpse. A moment later, she speared the zombie's head with her hellhound horn and flung it across the room. It hit a box full of inhalers, knocking it over and spilling them across the floor. Zenith collapsed next to me, trembling and breathing hard, blood flowing down her back. From the Journal of Midnight Shower Day 13 Inquiries are proceeding with an abysmal pace. A few zebras seem to know, a very few seem to know, much of their homeland's folklore, and I have received more than just one admonishment for using that phraseology. The zebras insist that Equestria is their homeland. It would seem that a large portion of the town's population are either unschooled in their heritage, or have chosen to abandon anything that would tie them to the zebras they were fighting, including an adamantly feigned ignorance about any aspects of their homeland's culture and religion. I cannot blame them. There have been a number of small incidents since I've arrived. These have mostly been spray painting, broken flower, flower pots, tumbled gardens, and other minor harassments. But I do not understand that a constant air of intolerance, perpetrated by an insignificant few, could have an impact on the general psyche. The soldiers who are charged with protecting the residents from such incursions are more worrisome than the hooligans themselves. I've come to learn that a few of the newly assigned mares and bucks served at Shattered Hoof Ridge. I'll be writing a correspondence before the week is out, suggesting that perhaps it would be better to rotate out any member of our military recently evolved in battle with the Striped. Remember this place, little one? Zena said softly, as Calamity inexpertly applied Zena's blood slopped gloop to the last of our bandages. I would want to return here. I nodded as I opened the laboratory's safe wall. I'd hoped for some medicine, but instead I found revolver ammo, a few decaying books, and a recipe for making dash. I gave the last to Zenith, taking the ammo for myself. I took a moment to mark the lab on my Pitluck auto map before trotting up to the wall terminal that operated the door on the opposite side of the labs. This one was a lot easier to hack, and the door slid open. Zenith moved slowly, letting the bandages mince her wounds as best she could, it could. The zombie zebra had gotten more flesh than meat, but she still needed a healing potion, and we had used all we had scavenged, burning off the effects of the pink cloud. She edged up to an intact chemistry set and opened her satchel, pulling out jars of ingredients and strips of bloodwing leather. Seeing that Zenith was preparing to brew, I turned to Calamity. Steelhooves and I will scout ahead. You stay here with Zenith. 
The Pegasus's enclave weapons had proven the best we had against zombie uh, zebras in an enclosed space. There were two puddles of glowing gloop on the floor that would never get up again. I closed the door to the laboratory behind us. Now that I knew the passwords, accessing them would be easy, and I didn't want to give our enemies easy access. We moved forward. The water spilled into the tunnel through the countless pipes and gutter, hoses, gutter holes. Thunder echoed from the sewers for long seconds after cracking from, from the outside. With all the noise, even steel hooves was almost able to be stealthy. We turned a corner and stopped, seeing the glittering wall of an alicorn shield covering the passage ahead. On the other side of the shield, the water level had built up until it filled the entire passage. Two dark green alicorns sat motionlessly in front of the shield, flanking a turret like guardian statuettes. Tunnel, not turret. What in the... With a blast of light, the dark purple teleporter appeared between her two green sisters. She was bleeding from wounds caused by the terminal explosion. Steel dropped into a battle stance. I pulled out my sniper rifle, kicking out my targeting spell, hoping I could get a shot off before she put up her shield. Gotcha, she grinned wickedly. Her horn flared as she vanished with a flash. Taking the two other alicorns with her, the shield spell disappeared, and the wall of water came rushing at us. I kicked, fighting to break to the surface of the rushing water as it washed me violently through the Zebra Town sewers. My head pushed above water, and I gasped for air in the moment before it pulled me under again. My body twisting about in the swift, churning water, my sense of direction torn away. I felt my body slam into a set of iron bars. My head began to throb, terrible pressure building in my horn, agony filling my eyes, ears. I tried to use the bars as a guide to push myself to the surface, lungs burning, desperate for air. Instead, I horned the floor to the sewer, sending a spasm of pain through my head. I gasped, drinking water into my lungs, beginning to drown. In a panic, I reversed my direction and pushed myself as hard as I could. My head burst through the water, like rushing underground river, pressing me hard against the grating. I coughed up water, my head splitting in pain, my horn feeling like I was about to explode. My eyes were red with bloody tears. Oh goddesses! A broadcaster! I was pinned. I couldn't swim away. Gasping, my mind crying in the most exquisite pain, I forced myself to dive back down. I opened my eyes, looking around the murky, fast-moving water, and quickly spotted the skeleton of several ponies, or possibly zebras, who had washed up against the iron bars. One of them had a pit buck on its foreleg. As swiftly as I could, my vision doubled as the pony in my head screamed. I tore the skeleton's foreleg away, pit buck and all. I twisted it, pushing it between the bars. The torrent washed the pit buck and its corrupted broadcaster away. I lurched back above the waves. Coughing heavily, the pain in my head instantly gone, save for a lingering headache. Though through the iron bars, I could see the cold gray light of the stormy day. With the water spilling out of the end of the drainage tunnel, I was trapped in. I panted harshly, letting the water pin me against the bars, until the dulge lessened into a breast-high stream. Something hard and metal dug into my rump. I moved, then felt the water with my hooves my sniper rifle. A few minutes later, a single white light cut through the darkness of the tunnel behind me. At first, I thought it was a one-eyed zombie zebra, but then I recognized Steelhoof's helmet spotlight. My friend trotted towards me, splashing in the sewer river. From the Journal of Midnight Shower Day 23 My research is beginning to bear fruit. Apparently, the most knowledgeable zebra in town regarding the old tales is currently being held prisoner in the Zebra Town Police Station, although the shopkeeper I spoke to was either unable or willing to comment on the crimes for which he is being held. I will attempt to gain an audience with the prisoner tomorrow. Nearly a month into my exile, as much as I miss the castle, there is something about this strange, dirty, little peasant town that is growing on me, albeit not in an altogether pleasant way. 
The shopkeepers no longer look at me with suspicion, and I enjoyed a crisp hay lunch with Daisy this afternoon. However, it is becoming increasingly clear that despite the constable's insistence to the contrary, this town has a deeply embedded contraband problem. There have been three deaths in the outlying farmlands within the last four to three weeks that can be connected to a newly banned drug called Dash. The deaths involve one overdose and two shootings, the latter both by the same individual who was high on the drugs at the time she committed the murders. Combine this with a few of my own observations within the town, and I'm becoming confident that Zebra Town has its hooves deep in either the distribution or possibly even manufacturing of this dangerous substance. On the way home, I noticed a couple of ponies trying to sneak into the town carrying what looked like bottles of liquor. Their behavior was suspicious enough that I stopped them and began asking their business in town loudly enough that one of the nearby soldiers couldn't help but take note. Unsurprisingly, the ponies quickly remembered an appointment somewhere else. No more exploring the sewers. At least, not until every other possibility had been exhausted. The Alicorns had shown just how easily they could turn into a death trap. Since when do Alicorns say, Gotcha? I asked, standing shakily on the cobblestone streets of Zebra Town, in a few inches of water. After what I had been through, I wasn't so concerned about getting wet anymore, no matter how many ribbons of pink I could see in the water. The pyrolite circled overhead, seeming happy to see us again. We had managed to get separated from Zenith and Calamity, and I was dreading having to go back down to find them. No, better that I send Steelhoof to fetch them. At least he couldn't drown. I looked around, realizing that I had lost track of my metal clad companion. The Applejack's ranger had been standing right next to me a moment ago. Turning, I spotted him standing at the edge of the roadside, staring at his hooves silently. I trotted up, asking if he was alright. I died here, he said, before falling into a long, strange silence. From the Journal of Midnight Shower Day 24 I was on my way to meet with a local constabulary, when I was forced to alter my normal approach due to several large, pony-drawn wagons blocking the street. Not being in a rush, I decided to take the scenic route around, taking an opportunity to locate and browse a store I had heard of, nestled in a back corner of Zebra Town, which reputably sells replica ceremonial zebra, zebra masks. I believe the proprietor of such a store would naturally possess a wealth of knowledge about zebra customs and, by extension, beliefs. My plan for the afternoon were to disturb were disturbed by a quickly muffled call for help. Apparently, a few of Equestria's finest decided to have their way with a rather comely zebra mare. By the time I arrived on the scene, the bucks were on the ground, sprawling before the very angry commanding officer. A sergeant by the name of Applesnack, who my lady learned was one of the soldiers transferred here after Shattered Hoof Ridge. From the way one of the soldier bucks held his ribs as he lipped away, it was clear that the sergeant had chosen a non-vocal means of intervention in the would-be assault, although he certainly had come had some choice words for them after he had bucked them flat. What had been the greatest impact on me, however, was what happened after. I was taking note of the sergeant's name with intention of recommending some manner of recommendation, when the zebra mare, shaken and hobbling, reached out a hoof to thank him. Sergeant Applesnack rounded, pushing her away, and informing her that he stopped those bastards because they were a disgrace to Equestria, and most emphatically, not for the likes of her. I feel another letter in this order, this time addressed directly to the princess herself. Shuluv's gaze was fixed on the stones of the road before him. In the cobblestones, I found four hoof prints. They looked like they had melted themselves into the stone. Slowly, Shuluv stepped forward, placing a hoof into each of the indentions. I felt an odd shudder, 
as I saw that matched perfectly. He looked up towards the specter of Canterlot directly above us. I was here the day Equestria died, he said slowly. I stood still, listening. We knew the end was coming. Applejack and I were here, evacuating every pony and zebra we could. Stable 3 was locked behind the princess's shield, but there were others nearby. He turned to me. You cannot imagine what it is like to look up and see the missiles slamming into the shield around Canterlot, trying to break their way in and kill every pony inside. He looked away. Then we got word that the zebras had wiped Cloudsdale out of the sky. Applejack excused herself and raced to Ponyville. I. He gave a shuddering sigh. I never blamed her for leaving. Or for ordering me to stay. There was no pony to blame here but myself. From the tibber in the stoic ghoul's voice, I could tell my friend was actually crying. My heart went out to him, unable to hear, uh, bare hearing, my stalwart Applejack's ranger, finally unable to hide his hurt. We had been trying to repair our relationship ever since the night she had seen the darkness in me. I wanted to save us, but the damage was too deep. She would hardly look at me anymore. I didn't understand why she was fighting to keep us together, when I didn't deserve her. But then, I didn't know she was pregnant either. I wanted to hold him, to comfort him somehow, but I knew he wouldn't be able to feel it. That armor of his separated him from the rest of us. All I could do was be somebody who was here and who would listen. Sulus tried to shake off his sorrow. I remained here. She left me in charge of the evacuation in her absence. I had been in Zebra Town before. I knew the place. None of my other troops had that familiarity with Zebra Town. It was a logical choice. He looked up, remembering as he spoke. My mind's eye insisted on painting a picture from his words. The princess's shield was huge, he reminded me. Several hundred yards above the city, the shield bisected the waterfalls that poured down into Canterlot. All that water came down and had no place to go. It pulled at the bottom of the shield as the missiles began impacting from above. Water absorbs the pink cloud all too readily. When the shield collapsed, the water fell down on Zebra Town like a tidal wave from the sky, except the water was saturated pink. That wave washed over the town and every pony, every one left inside of it. He looked down again, stepping back from the indentations in the cobblestones, his voice carrying a pained nostalgia that told me just how much he didn't like being in this place. I was standing right there. From the Journal of Midnight Shower, Day 27. My correspondence to Princess Luna continues to go unanswered. I took the star metal to one of the town's jewelers for their appraisal, only to find myself kicked out of her shop and never told to return. This from the same mayor who swore now six days ago that she neither knew nor cared a thing about the old zebra tales. I was just leaving when a chariot raced by, drawn by a very familiar looking pony as two others hurled burning bottles and shouted anti-zebra ep uh, <coughs> epitaphs too foul to sully myself repeating. One of the bottles crashed through the window of the jewelry shop, setting it ablaze. Doing what any good pony would have done, I tried to gallop to the shopkeeper's aid, but she fought me off, tossing a silver tea set at me before fleeing out the back entrance. I suffered smoke inhalation and some minor burns, but nothing serious. The shopkeeper, likewise, was relatively unharmed. Not all were so lucky. A small zebra filly was caught in one of the fires, and remains in the hospital, badly burned. The hospital here is poorly equipped and sparsely staffed, but they're doing all they can with healing potions and stuff from 
the zebra recipes you wouldn't likely find in the books of the Amphiomes of the Ministry of Arcane Sciences. The zebra filly shares the hospital with one of her attackers. Two of the ponies are being held in Zebra Town Police Station until a transfer wagon arrives. Again, we have Sergeant Steelhoofs to thank. The sergeant responded to the attack by drawing his sidearm and shooting the mare pulling the chariot in the leg. I must take a moment to praise Zebra Town's firefighting force, who had put the flames under control before the fires could spread to nearby buildings. I spent most of the evening with the local constabulary, repeating endlessly my accounts of the evening. I attempted to use the opportunity to learn more about the zebra prisoner they had sealed in isolation. My efforts at gaining an actual audience having come to naught. This evening, one of the zebra constables denied to inform me that the prisoner was charged with smuggling contraband in Equestria, as well as another charge that I believe can best be translated as heresy. When I questioned whether the contraband was related to the increasing number of dash-related incidents, the constable abruptly denied any connection between Zebra Town and the local drug problem, proclaiming the influx of dash was almost certainly coming from someone else associated with nearby vicinity, pharmaceuticals. Instead, the constable insisted that the contraband in this case amounted to a book. When I asked if I might see the book in question, stating that it might shed some light on my research, the zebra informed me that he would be more than happy to oblige me if it were not for the unfortunate fact that the Ministry of Image confiscated the book, removing it from their contraband vault a scant few days before. Heresy and I had a very dark suspicion of what that meant, and what book had been taken from the zebra's contraband vault. We were heading to the Cantalot ruins to get that book, that very black book, from Rarity's secret safe, at the behest of the Trixie goddess. I did not know what my plans were from that point, but I had made it very clear to myself that getting the black book to Maripony was crucial. Calamity and Zenith had rejoined us, and now we were crouched in the ruins of a nameless shop, staring acro across pardon me, the cobblestone plaza at the Zebra Town police station. Thanks to the journal of Midnight Shower, I had gotten the idea that this was the best place to look for the alicorns and the prisoners. I heard a soft ding behind me as Calamity raided the store's bit register. I didn't even bother shaking my head. I pulled up my binoculars, looking the zebra police station over. The aqueduct ran right behind the station, and part of it had collapsed, taking about a fourth of the building with it. The remains of the Zebra Town police station stood in two separate sections, connected only by the basement. I spotted an alicorn on the roof of the larger section. This was the place. I looked at the front door and realized immediately that we would need to find another point of access. Not because of guards or locks, but because of a metal that the double doors had been warped, fusing it together. I suspected the collapsing aqueduct had poured a heavy amount of pink water onto the building's door, causing all manner of mischief. What section do you believe my they are holding my daughter in? Oh, that's easy, Calamity answered for me. Whichever section we don't try first. From the Journal of Midnight Shower. Day 28. My efforts to find the little shop that sells zebra ceremonial masks have again been thwarted by a combination of obscure, local, and conflicting directions. To an extent, I can understand and forgive the zebras for their agitation. Any business seeping in the heritage of their native land would increase the negative perception of equestrian zebras, and likely become a magnet for attacks like the one yesterday. I was able to encourage a young buck to sneak or to speak with me in return for my discretion regarding a transaction between himself and several foals where an inhalers were exchanged for bits. Not only do I have a possible or have a possibility for more accurate description of the store's locale, but the buck divulged 
a few slippery tenets of the stripped mindset regarding Princess Luna. Okay, cool. For example, according to Zebra folklore, the Princess Luna's madness and depths of evil can only be explained by, and he said, this with such a diverse tone, clearly scoffing at such superstitious external forces. When I queried him further, asking what he meant by external forces, he laughed and responded, The stars, you silly pony, the stars. In an attempt to engender cam Rottery, I suggested that if he really wishes to rebel against the foolishness of his elders, he could always get a star-shaped tattoo. To my surprise, he grew upset. His words, minus the unnecessary and rather crude remarks, amounted to, I mock their old religion because I am smart, old religion because I am smarter than they are, not because I am stupid. After that, I could get nothing further from him. This brings to mind a tangentially related bit of gossip. The man who took the bullet in the leg died last night. The official statement claimed ill-defined complications. If the rumor was true, she went into dash withdrawal during surgery. In a small way, the attack was the zebra's own fault. And on that topic, I passed Sergeant Steelhooves on my way to the markets. The stallion was busy rubbing down his combat armor. Some pony had vandalized it most erigiously by painting stripes on the protective plates and scrawling Zebra Lover on one of the boots. I remembered my word. It was completely unfair that he should have suffered ridicule for the stalwart performance of his duties, something I felt the majority of soldiers here neglected more often than not. Tossing the scrub brush, he spat and told me, I hate this town, and will be happy to leave it. Places like this make it hard to simply hate zebras and love ponies. We conversed for a short while, and during the course of the discussion, I found myself proclaiming the belief that these zebras were equestrian citizens, like any pony, and deserved no less than love and friendship. After all, it was not their fault they were born with stripes. They had no choice in the matter. If they did, I am sure they would have chosen to be ponies. It is not as if they were making a fashion statement. I have always been very open-minded, an egalitarian pony, after all. He replied, True, but I'm a soldier. He spoke, as if it behooves a soldier to only think of zebras as the enemy and nothing more. Perhaps there is wisdom in that, but if so, it makes me thankful that I am not a military pony. This is the last you'll see of me. I volunteer for a special assignment with the Ministry of Wartime Technology. My wagon pulls out this weekend, and I will never set hoof in this wretched town again. Equestria willing, I'll never have to play peasant or pleasant with a zebra again either. Zebra Town, I suspect, will be worse off for his absence. I stopped reading. My ears perked up at the sound of exploding missiles at least two blocks away. I whispered a quick prayer for steel hooves. Surely, the mighty alicorn hunter wouldn't have difficulty taking down one alicorn. I hoped. I quickly chided myself for worrying. Steel hooves was the most resilient, ghoul pony creature thing in the entire Danver wasteland. I should have more faith in my friends. But, still, I worried for their safety any time a plan called for anyone other than me to be the one taking risks alone. Clement would probably clop me upside the head if he knew what I was thinking. Hell, Homage would. Well, actually, Homage would probably clop me someplace else and make me like it. And I really shouldn't be thinking about things like that at a time like this. Focus, little pip, focus. Clemity and Zenith and I had pushed through what had once been an interior door in an upper floor of the Zebra Town police station. The collapse had left the door exposed to the outside, giving us a point of ingress. Parlet threw him behind us silently. At this point, our efforts were light on stealth, so Steelhoofs had volunteered to draw away the rooftop alicorn as we snuck inside. I found myself struggling to, bo to both like and dislike midnight shower. I suppose it didn't matter either way. 
the pony was long dead. Maybe I cared because the royal astronomer had been given the amazing gift of enjoying the presence of Celestia and Luna, personally. Or maybe it was because that this was some pony who had known steel hooves at a rather difficult time in his life, and it made the effort to at least be cordial. However, the pony's civil bigotry continued to jar me, and to think this was a member of the royal castle. Before leaving him behind, I had asked Steelhoofs about his first time in Zebra Town, letting him know that I had the journals from the Raggard Hut, and mentioned his name. The attempted assassination of Princess Celestia was a horrific, and the horrific death of Big Macintosh struck deeply with every pony. Amongst those affected the worst were those of us in Big Macintosh's company. After the Battle of Shattered Hoof Ridge, Steelhoofs had told me, Princess Luna ordered all the soldiers involved in the station to be stationed closer to the heart of Equestria and away from the front lines for at least half a year. Or to from the war, combined with the offer of counseling. His assignment had been in Zebra Town, keeping the peace. There were faint hints of pink in the room beyond. The effects were minimal, making me feel vaguely sick, rather than the swift and cloying death of the concentrated pink we had experienced in the bathhouse. Still, we had to move swiftly. I prayed the alicorns weren't keeping the prisoners in a contaminated section. If so, the zebras we were to rescue were probably already dead. The first room opened to a narrow hallway. Calamity spread his wings, only to have him hit the wall on either side. Well now, that just ain't fair, he grumbled. Stupid zebra architecture. He looked at Zenith, apologetically. No offense. None taken. We crept forward, moving from one room to the next. Pyrolite and I took the lead. My self-levitating allowed me to clear away trip wires and disarm pressure plates that the alicorns had set up all over the floors. Again, the alicorns tactics struck me as unusual. I heard voices up ahead, a strangely majestic voice of the pseudo goddesses. Only this time, the voices were strangely different. I couldn't put my hoof on exactly why. I waved a hoof at those behind me, motioning them to stay back, and I slowly crept forward, listening. We have enough striped ponies, right? One of them said. We have... She beat her hoof on the floor eight times. That many. No, we have this many, another said, hoof tapping seven times. The scrawny one died when they went through the pink below. Remember? All the striped ponies are scrawny, the first complaint complained. Let us just take those we have and leave this goddess forsaken place. There was something odd in the way they referred to themselves. Hell, the whole conversation was bizarre. We hate it here. A third alicorn spoke up. I froze, realizing the whole damn wing of the creatures was in the room right next to me. I started to back up, trying to think of another way around. We couldn't fight them, particularly not in such cramped quarters. We were thoroughly fucked. This guy's forsaken place makes us remember things. I hate remembering things, the third voice continued. And all at once I realized why their voices sounded strange. I wasn't hearing them just in my head, with my ears. Last night, I remember that I used to be a buck. Luna spanked me with withers. The pink cloud was messing with her telepathy. They were cut off from the goddess's influence here. No wonder Trixie needed us as her agents in Canterlot. Then the other who fell. The Canterlot ruins were supposed to be full of alicorns. And those alicorns didn't know we were supposed to be friendlies. We were all sorts of fucked. I turned back, motioning the others back down the hall. From the journal of the night shower, day 29. Today was an amazing day. After two store owners refused to speak to me about the star metal, I finally located the ceremonial mask shop and met with the proprietor. This time, I was cautious not to produce or even mention knowledge of the metal. Instead, 
asking about zebra legends surrounding the meter showers, explaining away my curiosity with my cutie mark. In return, the old zebra mare told me plenty, albeit in hushed tones and only after pulling me into a back room and closing up her store. She spoke of how zebras believed that the stars themselves were visible avatars of unholy entities so unfathomable that our minds would crack she would perceive more than a notion of them. Beings of such primordial and loathing that with all the evils of the, our world were no match for their vileness and cruelty. Much of this I had heard before, but not so chilling a fashion, nor with much utter conviction. Amongst the most interesting of her tales was a story thousands of years old, telling of one of the first zebra cities and how it was destroyed by huge meteor impacts during the earliest records of meteor showers. The city had been a zebra hub of trade and politics, and its destruction plunged the nation into a hundred years of tribal civil wars. I do believe that the events of this tale, if true, represent the historical roots of what has become the dominant zebra mythology. I had settled down on a park bench near the celestial fountain, a zebra's rather hoof-forward way of saying, where equestrians too, I suspect. But one of those huge, new model whirlamagigs, a Griffin Chaser 5, descended out of Canterlot, landing on the far side of the Zebra Town Commons. Now, despite my position as Royal Astronomer, I never actually seen one of the Ministry Mares. Today, I saw two. Fluttershy, Mayor of the Ministry of Peace, emerged from the passenger compartment, along with eight other ponies, five of whom were carrying pink suitcases. Pinkie Pie, mayor of the Ministry of Morale, stepped down from one of the six pedestal positions and ordered the heavily laden ponies to follow her as she marched through the front gate leading to one of the zebra huts, opened the door, and went inside. Fluttershy politely requested the company of the remaining three and departed straight for the hospital. Half an hour later, Pinkie Pie's five ponies emerged from the house, storing their suitcases in the Griffin Chaser and began going door to door through the neighborhood. Not long after, Pinkie Pie herself emerged from the house, closing the door behind her, trotting up to the front gate and planting something at the base of the gate underneath netting, designed to look like dirt, then kicked dirt onto it for good measure. Then the ministry, or the mayor of the Ministry of Morale proceeded to disguise herself as a trash can with a fake beard. I must admit, it was amusing. I will admit that I allowed my curiosity the better of me. I sat on the bench for over an hour, watching the bearded trash can, watch the empty and apparently booby-trapped hut. My patience was rewarded when Fluttershy and her ponies returned, escorting a happily stunned zebra couple as their little filly dodged about their legs. I had not seen the filly until after she had been horribly burned and it is doubtful that I would have recognized her even if I had, as zebras all tend to look alike. <clears throat> but it was not difficult to deduce who the filly might be. Likewise, it became swiftly evident that the hut invaded by the Ministry of Morale earlier was her home. Even then, I was not ready for the explosion triggered when the little filly stepped onto Pinkie Pie's concealed pressure plate. I suspected they would be cleaning up confetti from the Zebra Town Commons for weeks not to mention streamers from several of the rooftops. The little filly was utterly delighted after she crawled out from underneath her parents' hooves. The blast of trumpets nearly had me cowering under the bench. The zebras poured out of the nearby huts, although I was not sure how many did so on account of the invitations, and how many were just trying to make sure their house wasn't being bombed. But the vast majority of them joined in the festivities regardless. It all brought a smile to my face. Even if zebra fillies have a very little different preference for party music than a proper cantalot pony, the only one fact, in fact, who was not smiling was Pinkie Pie herself. But I suspect that maybe have been because she was she had thrown such an amazing party and didn't have time to stay and enjoy it. The two ministry mares and their company were lifting the air on that six-pedal pony flyer before the filly had even gotten to cut the cake.